Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. So again, before we commence our study this morning, I'm going to invite those that can to please kneel with me for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jehovah, for lending us another day of life. We pray that you forgive us for our sins, our shortcomings, and you'll help us to hear your word and your word alone this morning. Help us to receive the instruction and apply it to our life that we may be ready and able to stand as probation is nearing its conclusion. We thank you and we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning once again. And um, there's a, a lot going on in our world today, right now, isn't there? Too much, perhaps, for me to even mention. Um, but none of this matters if we are not making steps to getting ourselves prepared. What do you say? Oftentimes we get caught up with the things of this world that the most important thing that we should be doing, we neglect to do. And that is to prepare ourselves, not necessarily for the things that are coming, but for the close of probation. And so there's only one thing that I have to share, and that is taken from the scripture reading that we read, which is found in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So God's call for every single one of us today is for us to be what? Holy. holy. And the reason why is because he himself is holy. And that's the reason why Jehovah calls every single one of us to be holy. We read, for I am Jehovah your God, sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy again, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that moves upon the earth. So again, we read the command or the call for us to be holy because God himself is holy. And according to this passage, we are not to partake of anything that Jehovah has labeled unclean. Doing so, we become detestable before him. Verse 42 reads, Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, and whatsoever goeth upon all four, or whatsoever hath more feet among all creeping things that creep upon the earth, them, she, them ye shall not eat, for they are an abomination. And verse 43, we read, Ye shall not make yourselves what? Abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall ye make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereof. So again, by partaking of these unclean things, we do not only defile ourselves, but we become detestable in the eyes of God. Pretty serious, what do you say? By partaking of that which is unclean, according to the Bible, that is what we become. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, we read, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, Jehovah your God, am holy. So again, 
the call to all the congregation of Israel to be holy because Jehovah our God is holy. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26, we read, And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, Jehovah, am holy, and have set you apart from the peoples, that ye should be mine. So again, we see a repetition in these scriptures, the calling for all God's people to be holy. And not just what you might think what it means to be holy. God makes it clear, like I am holy. And how is God ho holy? Well, when we, when we study his word, we get a viewpoint of who and what God is and how holy he is. Does it matter what we eat? What we eat matters. It matters. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Let's take a look. Because we know that in the eyes of many people today, what we eat and drink doesn't matter, right? That's the, the common thought or belief, even among those who profess to be among the people of God. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we must do what according to this passage? We must cleanse ourselves from all filthiness that pertains to what? The flesh and spirit. Flesh by those things that are fleshly, we can understand that to be physical, the things that we partake of physically and spiritually, but the things that we behold or hear that defile us by partaking of these things. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. What is the command here? And, and, and uh, to narrow it down, to love God with all of our being, right? That's pretty much what this passage is telling us. To love God with all of our being. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So it's according to this passage, if we destroy God's temple, what's the result? We too will be destroyed. What are some things that are harmful to our body? What are some of these things? I'm not going to point out a list of things. I'll probably, it, it's quite a few, right? You might say, well, everyone eats this or that. See, that's the problem. That when we find something to be harmful, we oftentimes filter that through, well, such and such eats it, and such and such does, you know, partakes of that, and that's the problem that we are watching what others do. Our mental attitude should be, I have a race to win, the race of life. And because of this, I make this, this, this decision not to defile myself with such things. And my body belongs to God. And that should be our mental attitude because we are loyal to him and to his son and that we should not be uh, influenced by what others do or even by what others say. Notice this statement here. The habits of the age are serious obstacles to the perfecting of Christian character. 
Physically, we are composed of what we eat, and our minds are greatly influenced by our bodies. So what are we composed of according to this statement? Of what we eat, of what we partake of. And these are serious obstacles to the perfecting of Christian character. Do we need to perfect Christian character? Yes. So if we partake of those things, they're serious obstacles. And they're going to, they're going to prevent us from obtaining Christian character. It's serious. It is impossible for those who indulge the appetite to attain to Christian perfection. It is what? Impossible. If we indulge in appetite, it is impossible for us to attain to Christian perfection. If we weaken these powers of mind or body by wrong habits, or indulge a perfected appetite, it will be impossible for us to honor God as we should. So if we indulge ourselves in appetite, even among those things that are good, I would say, they're going to interfere because the mind and the body are one. And one will affect the other. And where does God communicate with his children? Through what channel? Through the mind. And our mind needs to be awake in order to hear that still small voice that so often we struggle to hear. There was a particular day that was chosen to judge the people and cleanse the temple. What day is this? The Day of Atonement. And what would happen in the Day of Atonement? What was done during this day? Does anyone know what would happen during this time? The high priest would go into the sanctuary to perform a work of what? Cleansing. A cleansing of all the accumulated sins found therein. And anyone who had not confessed and forsaken his sin or her sin was cut off. We are, not, we are now living in the antitypical day of atonement. And how often do we forget? So, Jesus is now where? Where is Jesus? In the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And what work is he performing there? A work of judgment and a work of cleansing. The heavenly sanctuary is being cleansed from what? Sin. Now, can you imagine? And for those um, hardworking wives and mothers um, with, with the home, can you imagine you clean up your house? And as soon as you're done, someone comes in just to dirty it? Or they're not careful to clean their shoes? When this day Jesus is doing a cleansing work in the heavenly sanctuary, and we as God, God's people should be cleansing our souls so that we can stop confessing our sins and our sins entering the sanctuary in heaven. Otherwise, when is it ever going to stop? You see that? But it's going to stop and it's going to end because God will have a people that will overcome sin. And I pray that we are all found in that class. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So see, we see a cooperation. We read scriptures to cleanse ourselves. And now we read 
that God himself is in this work of also cleansing you. During this period, the following was done. And this shall be a statue forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. In the following verse, um, we read, It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statue forever. A Sabbath of rest could mean rest from your own works or stop relying on your own effort, but rely on God's love and His Word. The Sabbath is also a holy day which should, where, where holy activities should be done and not secular activities, which those that are holy will draw us closer to Jehovah and His begotten Son. Jesus is our high priest today. We read, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. In the next verse, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. For Christ... Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. This is the final work. The work that is taking place is the final work. And Daniel 8, 14 pointed to this event, when the heavenly sanctuary would be cleansed. Some, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. And some men, they follow after. 1 Timothy 5, 24. How many of you become afraid when we hear the term judgment? Any of you? How many of you become afraid when you hear the term atonement or the day of atonement, or for that matter, the investigative judgment, a term which is not found in the Bible, right? We don't find the term investigative judgment. But we know that there is a pre-advent judgment, a judgment that takes place to review the records so that when Christ comes, he will give his reward to those that he will be coming for. So there needs to be a judgment, an investigation of those who have professed to have accepted Christ, to whether they are faithful and loyal to him and are worthy to enter into his kingdom or not. We are in the great day of atonement when our sins are, by confession and repentance, to go beforehand to judgment. God does not now accept a tame, spiritless testimony from his ministers. Such a testimony would not be present truth. The message for this time must be meat in due season to feed the church of God. But Satan has been seeking gradually to rob this message of its power, that the people may not be prepared to stand in the day of the Lord. We need to be prepared to stand. What do you say? I mean, I, I don't know. All, all minds work differently. Um, as I was listening to the prayer request and what was shared, I literally hear those things and I shake my head. I'm affected when I hear about someone getting closer to death, lying on her deathbed. Someone just died. I hate hearing those things. It bothers me. It bothers me when someone asks for prayer because they have cancer or this terminal illness. It just, 
I don't know, I can't really take that in very positively. I want this, this, this world to come to a conclusion, to come to an end. And in order for that to happen, there's a few things that need to transpire, but this is one. God's people must be ready. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. We need to be cleansed and free from sin. I'm also, I will share with you, and please don't take this in, in a negative way. Because of this, because of the call, and because we know, or we should know, that time is very short, our minds should be busy in doing the work that we need to be doing now, which is our examining ourselves and making changes in our own personal life so that we can be found ready. And when Nick called me and he asked me to, if I can, you know, share with you all this Sabbath, he was supposed to be here, but we know what happened, and he's not here. Um, I decided, okay, well, what can I speak on, or what can I share? And I want to confess to you that it's, it happens every time. When I share something, or when I start putting something together to share, these words first talk to me. And they shake me. They shake me in a sense where I become um, disturbed. It, it robs, it takes away my peace. And the reason why it takes away my peace is because my mind, it's not where it's supposed to be. We know we got to survive, right? We all know that. We all know we got to make a living somehow, right? But if all those things are consuming our time and, I, and not allowing us or getting in the way of doing the, the most important wor work in this world, then we need to, you know, throw those things out. What do you say? Let me, let me, paint, you, let me paint you this scenario. Most careers... Four years. There's nothing wrong. Don't, don't misunderstand me either. Four years. And a lot of it um, has, takes a lot of work. Takes a lot of time. But there's something that we don't, we, don't, we don't have in mind. That tomorrow is not what? Guaranteed. So we've, three years down the road... And something happens, and I pass. What then? We need to pray, and we need to ask, Dear Father, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do? All these signs that are taking place, there's, to me, to me, is nothing more than the mercy of God. Telling me, I'm almost, we're almost done here. Things are wrapping up. And Jesus is about to stand up. And these signs 
should be telling you there's no more time for that. Do we get the picture? Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. I would love when my mother would read me this portion of it when I was younger. The Bible says, do what your heart tells you to do. But I would hate when she would, <laughs> when she would come to the, the, the ending part of the verse. But know that God will bring you into judgment for everything that you do. That's the part I didn't like to hear. But that's the truth. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Every what? Idle word. Do we need to be careful with what we with what we say? Do we need to think before we utter something? Yes. And oftentimes it's just better to not say a word. Knowing these things, we should follow the following counsel. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is what? The whole duty of man. What message is this? The, yes. And this is fear God and keep his commandments? That's the first angel's message, right? Fear God. Fear him who created the heavens and the earth and the fountains of waters. Isn't that right? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. If we have any regard for our soul's salvation, we must make a decided what? Change. You know your life. You know what you're doing in your own personal life. I don't. But I know what I'm doing in my own personal life. And that testimony speaks to me. And I pray that that testimony speaks to you. And whatever changes you ought to, to make, make them. If you regard the salvation of your soul. We keep reading. We must seek the Lord with true penitence. We must with deep contrition of soul confess our sins that they may be blotted out. In the day of atonement, I always say there's only two things that will be blotted out. What are they? Either our sins or what? Or our names. I want for my sins to be blotted out. And for my name to remain. We must no longer remain upon the enchanted ground. We are fast approaching the close of our probation. Let every soul inquire, how do I stand before God? We know not how soon our names may be taken into the lips of Christ and our cases be finally decided. What, oh, what will these decisions be? Shall we be counted with the righteous, or shall we be numbered with the wicked? Here's the even more um, disturbing thought. Do we know that when our name comes up, 
we will have no clue. And it has been decided either for life or death. And we will, we will still have no clue. Do you know that? It's, it, it's solemn. We need to be ready every day. Not out of fear. Because I had a problem at first. Another confession I will make. Fear was a motivating factor. But what we need to do is change our, our, where, we have, where we have our eyes on and transfer them to the cross where we see the Son of God Dying for me, for you. That you will be motivated out of love for your creator and redeemer. Who risked it, he risked it all just for you. So the motivating factor should be love. In other words, son, my daughter, don't get so caught up here. You're not going to stay here. Isn't that how a loving parent will talk to, it, to its child? Don't stress about this and that. We're only going to be here temporary. We're going to a better land, a better world. Wouldn't that take a load off someone's back? But we often lose sight of those things because, again, we get caught up with the things of this world and how this world thinks. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. What is this image telling us? What is it telling you? What is that man trying to do? He's exerting himself to, exerting himself to do what? Squeeze himself, himself through that door, correct? Do you think that he'll be able to? What do you say? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I say he gets in if he exerts himself vigorously and doesn't give up. He'll get in. But if he gives up because it's difficult, do you think that he will get in? Strive to enter in. In, I'm sorry, strive to enter in by the narrow door. For many, I say unto you, shall seek to enter in, and what? And shall not be able. Isn't that something? Many will desire, many will strive to get in. But will they be able to according to this verse? Why? Why? Gave up. Seeing these things are thus all to be dissolved, what manner of persons are ye to be in all holy living and godliness? And holy living invo involves what? What does holy living involve? Surrender to God's requirements, right? Everything that pertains to life, we should be 
holy. And we can't say or we can't even consider the thought that it is impossible for us to be holy. Otherwise, God is asking for an impossibility. But we are to be holy in all manner of living, right? And this pertains not only to what we eat or what we drink, but to the things that we, often, we, that we watch and what we hear. What do you say? And not only to those things that we eat, I mean, I'm sorry, to what we hear and what we watch, but also in what we dress. Do we display holiness when someone sees us? Do they see someone holy? By our demeanor? I mean, you could be dressed as a holy person, but your countenance tells something completely different. And we are filled with the Spirit of Christ. I'm sure that others will be able to see Christ. And if they don't know Christ, they'll be able to see something different about this person. There's something different about him. And that's Christ in you. Also, how we talk. Do we need to be careful how we talk? Yes, our speech. Our speech as well. By this, by our life, we declare to the world who we serve. Who we serve. Can someone hand me the bulletin? I want to end with that. Did anyone take the time to read what is written here? I encourage everyone to read the whole entire thing. I would read only portions of it. You will be in constant peril until you understand the true forces of the will. You may believe and promise all things, but your promises or your faith are of no value until you put your will on the side of faith and action. If you fight the fight of faith with all your will power, you will what? Conquer. Your feelings, your impressions, your emotions are not to be trusted. For they are not reliable, especially with your perverted ideas and the knowledge of your broken promises and your forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in yourself and the faith of others in you. Are we to trust our emotions? Are we to rely upon them? Not even our own thoughts or impressions. But you need not despair. You must be determined to believe although nothing seems true and real to you. Isn't that, I don't know if this is describing your warfare. Don't you sometimes feel this way? Feel this way? You're overwhelmed by your feelings, by your emotions. And we need to snap out of it by the will. Will out of it. Will to remember the promises of God. Will to trust and rely wholly upon Him. No matter how you feel. That's what we're reading here. I need to tell you, it is you yourself that has brought you into this unenviable position. You must win back your confidence in God and in your brethren. It is for you to yield up your will to the will of Jesus Christ. And as, and as you do this, God would immediately, immediately take possession and work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
Your whole nature will then be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ, and even your thoughts will be subject to Him. You cannot control your impulses, your emotions, as you may desire, but you can control the will, and you can make an entire change. Is this easy to practice? No. And you know why it's not easy to practice? Because we haven't been practicing it. But the more we practice such thing, the more powerful we get. Do you believe that? We need to exercise our will. And as God sees that, as Christ sees that, we are told He takes our will because we have surrendered that will, our will, to Him. And we are subject to His thoughts. And guess what? And we are subject to His thoughts. And His thoughts, do they have negative emotions? His thoughts are perfect peace. And that will be our experience. Perfect peace. Don't you want to experience that? I do. By yielding up your will to Christ, your life will be hid with Christ in God and allied to the power which is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from God that will hold you fast to His strength and a new life, even the life of living faith, will be possible to you. But your will must cooperate with God's will, not with the will of associates through whom Satan is constantly working to ensnare and destroy you. And I'm going to skip down to the final paragraph. You need to read the entire thing. It's powerful. There is no such thing as following Christ unless you refuse to gratify inclination and determine to obey God. We need to do what? Determine to obey God. It is not your feelings, your emotions that make you a child of God, but doing God's will. What makes us, what constitutes us children of God? Doing His will. A life of usefulness is before you if your will become God's will. Then you may stand in your God-given manhood or womanhood, an example of good works. You will then help to maintain rules of discipline instead of helping to break them down. You will then help to maintain order instead of despising it and inciting to irregularity of life by your own course of action. I tell you in the fear of God, I know what you may be if your will is placed on the side of God. We are laborers together with God. You may be doing your work for time and eternity in such a manner that it will stand the test of the judgment. Will you try? That's the question. Will you now turn square about? That's the following question. You are the object of Christ's love and intercession. Will you now surrender to God and help those who are placed as sentinels to guard the interests of His work instead of causing them grief and discouragement? So in short, what must we do? Exercise our will. To obey God. What do you say? I pray that you have found encouragement in these words. I know I have. And I pray that you can make the changes that you need to make. So that when either we pass or Christ stands your name will remain. And with this, I invite you once again to pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Jehovah, for everything that you have done for us. You've given your Son so that we can inherit life. I pray that we can exercise our will, surrender our will to you, and not give in to those thoughts that discourage us and darken our world, but that we may keep constantly your word in mind, like David said, that he hid his word in his heart, that he may not sin against you. I pray that we can keep your word constantly upon our minds, in our heart daily, and that we can draw closer and closer to you as we see the day approaching, that we can be found ready and able to stand, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions